So at this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator and speaker. Shira Brisman will be moderating the question and answer session following today's lecture. Dr. Brisman is assistant professor in the history of art department uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, where she specializes in European art of the 15th through 18th centuries. Her first book, Albrecht Durer and the Epistolary Mode of Address, was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2016. She is currently at work on a second monograph entitled The Goldsmith's Debt, Conceptions of Property in Early Modern Art. In the fall of 2020, she taught a seminar to undergraduate and graduate students at Penn uh, titled uh, Privacy and Society, 17th Century Dutch Painting, which touched on many of the themes in the Inner World exhibition. She is also author of one of the essays in the exhibition catalog. Today's featured speaker is Nicole Elizabeth Cook. Dr. Cook is a museum professional and a scholar of early modern European art. She is interested in interrogating the traditional centering of Renaissance and Baroque art in museums and finding new ways for these works to resonate with today's audiences. At the Philadelphia Museum of Art, she currently facilitates academic engagement with regional art history departments and programming for fellows. She holds a PhD in art history from the University of Delaware, an MA in art history from Temple University, and a dual BFA in studio art and art history. She has previously had curatorial positions at the Science History Institute in Philadelphia and the Leiden Collection, our partner for this exhibition, and she regularly teaches and guest lectures at the college level. Her focus installation, What Can Paintings Tell Us? is currently on view at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and we'll put a link to that in the chat. And now I would like to invite Nicole Cook to present today's lecture, Inner Worlds and Late Hours, Nocturnal Imagery in Dutch Genre Painting. Welcome, Dr. Cook. Thank you so much, Heather, for that really lovely introduction. Can everyone hear me all right? I'm going to assume that someone will let me know if they cannot. Um, great. So thank you for the introduction. And I would like to thank uh, everyone at the Arthur Ross Gallery uh, and also Dr. Shira Brisman um, for making this program possible today. It is such a pleasure to be here and to revisit some old friends from the Leiden Collection. Night has never been exclusively for rest. John Milton, who was described as a night owl himself, famously wrote, what hath night to do with sleep? Before the industrial revolution, before the advent of gaslight and electricity, interrupted sleep and nighttime wakefulness were norms in European culture and in many cultures worldwide. As historians, including A. Roger A. Kirsch and Craig Koslowski have convincingly argued, sleep was segmented into multiple distinct phases, sometimes called a first sleep and a second sleep. In addition, over the course of the 1600s leading to the 1700s, people in Europe also gradually kept later hours. Depending on your class level, location, and gender, what you did during your wakeful hours at night would have varied greatly. You might get up to take care of necessary tasks like tending a child or checking something on the hearth. Uh, and for domestic workers, for farmers, and for most women, night brought more labor as often as it brought rest. However, night was also a time when people engaged in intimate activities, either with one another, or alone through prayer and spiritual reflection, reading or writing. You would have done all of this by candle or lamplight. The strength of light is now measured in lumens. Whereas we now measure electric and LED light in hundreds or thousands of lumens, the average wax candle gives off about 12 and a half. In this painting by Leiden-based artist Herit Dow on view in the exhibition, an older woman leans out her window, staring intently at something outside of our view. She parts her lips as if she is calling out to someone on the street. 
Deep shadows of night envelop the edges of the composition, which is tightly cropped around this architectural archway. An empty birdcage hangs on the archway to the left, or sorry, to the right of the composition, and a dead hen lays on the windowsill. In the interior of the room behind the woman, and I'm showing a detail here on the right, two figures warm themselves by a fireplace. While these figures in the background appear to share a moment of human connection, the woman in the foreground is suspended in her own internal thoughts. From its strong, warm quality of light to its heightened, illusionistic effects to the symbolism of candles and night. When Carrot Dow produced this painting in the early 1670s, he was building on several decades worth of artistic experimentation and play with depicting night and nocturnal visual effects. During my talk today, I'm going to walk through a brief history of depicting night in 17th century Europe with special attention to the Netherlands. Night was a mundane reality of 17th century life, but it was also a concept that held literary, artistic, and spiritual weight. Returning to Dow's painting, he used night as a component of his narrative. In one sense, night represents the final stages of a person's life cycle, along with the empty birdcage, the dead hen, and the burning candlestick, night emphasizes the woman's mature state. However, by cropping out whoever or whatever the woman responds to, Dow teased open a more ambiguous atmosphere in this painting. Instead of a straightforward allegory for aging, we are also drawn into the woman's own experience of night. Do we see the moment that she realizes that she sees someone she recognizes just as they step into the light? And just as we focus our eyes to perceive the strong highlights and pick out details in the deep shadows of this painting, we can imagine the woman focusing her gaze out towards the subject of her attention. The painting's focus then becomes sight itself. Knight's ability to affect the senses, especially sight, to simultaneously conceal and reveal, made it a natural foil for artists interested in pushing the boundaries of painting's ability to simulate life. While I'm focusing on nocturnal imagery in 17th century Dutch genre painting, I'm going to briefly take us back to the end of the 1500s in Italy. Depictions of night were common throughout the medieval and Renaissance eras in many parts of Europe. Yet the late 1500s in Rome marks a moment when nocturnal imagery emerged as a distinct artistic subject. By the end of the 1500s, in the wake of the Renaissance, many artists advanced purposefully jarring asymmetries and strong tenebristic contrasts of light and dark what we now think of as characteristic of Baroque style. Night and shadow intertwined with broader artistic interests in imitating the most transitory aspects of nature and in enhancing the emotional pull of dramatic narratives. Italian painter Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio was a major figure in this shift toward darker paintings. 17th century biographer Giovanni Pietro Bellori wrote that Caravaggio, quote, was becoming better known every day for the coloring that he was introducing, not sweet and with few hues as before, but intensified throughout with bold, dark passages, unquote. Caravaggio supposedly painted his not models not in daylight, but in the dusky air of a closed room. His new dark tenebrism was a powder keg in the hothouse atmosphere of the art scene in Rome, quickly gaining acclaim and criticism. Some critics even complained that his melancholic or quote unquote dark temperament led to his dark paintings. Regardless, he established a lasting bond between shadow and illusionism. In Caravaggio's Judith Beheading Halifernes, 
You can see how he used the deeply shadowed background to project his figures forward out of the picture plane and give a strong sense of three-dimensionality. Caravaggio chose a nighttime setting for its dramatic connection to the story and for its heightened visual effects. Comparing the painting with just a couple of earlier Renaissance depictions, we can see how Caravaggio recentered his painting on the very moment that Judith plunged her sword into her captor, Halifernes's neck, which she did under the protective veil of night. Mantegna's bluish black background on the left evokes night, but Caravaggio working a century, century later pushed his entire set piece into nocturnal shadow, sacrificing legibility for dramatic spectacle. Another backstory that factored into the uptick of artists' interest in exploring nocturnal imagery was the popularity of descriptions of two lost ancient Greek paintings written by Pliny the Elder. Pliny described two different paintings by Greek painters Lysias and Antiphilus that each pictured a boy blowing on a firebrand to light it. Pliny described how beautifully the light and shadow bounced off of the boy's face and around the room. You can see in these works by El Greco, who was working in Italy around the same time as Caravaggio, how he visually cited Pliny's description. Crucially, Pliny also noted that the unstable atmospheric effects of light bouncing off these different surfaces required an incredible amount of technical skill. In the intense artistic rivalry of the late 1500s and early 1600s, competing with ancient artists was an important way of proving dexterity and knowledge. During the early 1600s, many artists from the Netherlands traveled to Italy and especially to Rome specifically to familiarize themselves with artistic traditions and new developments. These traveling artists, including Flemish painter Peter Paul Rubens, contributed to the circulation of Caravaggio's dark style, along with interest in nocturnal imagery and depictions of artificial light. <clears throat> Rubens made these two paintings in the 16 teens, specifically as a response to themes of artificial light and nocturnal imagery advanced by El Greco, Caravaggio, and Caravaggio's followers. In these examples, Rubens adopted both the tenebrism, the intense contrast of light and dark, championed by Caravaggio, and the allusions to classical antiquity in El Greco's paintings. Rubens kept the study on the left of the old woman and boy with candles in his studio at home. He probably used it as a teaching tool for his students as an example of the methods artists could employ to achieve illusionistic effects using nocturnal settings. While nocturnal themes were mostly a passing interest for Rubens, other artists and other Netherlandish artists developed this specialty as a key component of their careers. Dutch painters Gerrit van Hontors and Charles de Brochen both spent time in Rome while Caravaggio's style was flourishing, and upon their return to Utrecht in the Netherlands, continued their adaptations of Caravaggio's style. They were also key figures in the rise of nocturnal themes in the Netherlands. According to Bellori, the same biographer as Caravaggio, Hontworst took Caravaggio's, quote, force of dark tones and he devoted himself to imitating nocturnal scenes by firelight." Unquote. In these two tavern scenes by Hontorst, you can see the play of artificial light and nocturnal darkness that captivated period viewers. The warm candlelight and its shallow depth unifies the groups together, and the shadows work to remove distance between the viewer and the picture plane. It appears that we could walk right up and join in. Jan Lievens, based in Leiden, was also keen to study the themes and compositional strategies employed by Hontworst and other Utrecht Caravagisti. 
In this painting from early on in Levin's career, you can see how he looked to Honthorst's own translations of Italian depictions of card players and tavern scenes. Levens also crops the scene closely, positioning the viewer just on the edge of the action at hand. Gambling and card playing went hand in hand with drinking, smoking, and flirting as nighttime activities during the 1600s. All widely popular and all widely criticized. With the close cropping, we're invited to focus in on key details illuminated by a hidden to us light source and to read the figure's expressions to try to figure out who is ahead in this game. Night and sight are again linked. The sense of intimacy with the figures in a painting was also key to the appeal of nocturnal imagery, particularly in scenes that play with romantic and erotic narratives. In this painting by Hontwurst, the subject is ostensibly a young woman picking fleas off of herself with the help of an older woman. However, the two male figures hiding to the left of the painting make its real intentions clear. Like them, we find ourselves spying on the women without their knowledge or consent. This conceit of a painting's ability to reveal people's and especially women's most private and intimate moments at home would become an incredibly popular subcurrent within nocturnal imagery. If not for the overt male intrusion, the women in Hontworth's flea hunt should be sharing the kind of intimate private moment that night would have provided. And depictions of night, not only as a time for taverns and revelry, but also for private introspection also grew in popularity over the first half of the 1600s. Gerard Tabrucken experimented with using a single visible candle to create intimate environments that showcased subtle emotional states of solitary isolated figures. With his simple robes, humble cap and eyeglasses, the figure in man writing by candlelight on the left portrays many of the classical allegorical attributes of learning and erudition. As we'll see a bit later, subsequent artists picked up on this bond between nighttime and intellectual labor. Meanwhile, in Allegory of Faith, which is now in the Leiden collection, the woman depicted is filled with inner knowledge of her spiritual revelation. The woman wears blue, commonly associated with the Virgin Mary. Unlike the man who uses the candlelight to illuminate his writing, the woman in Allegory of Faith looks neither at the candle nor at the oil lamp on the wall, but upward toward a higher spiritual realm. Many early modern leaders of different religious denominations advised people to spend their wakeful time at night on prayer and spiritual reflection. In one text titled Midnight Thoughts, Englishman Sir William Killigrew remarked that, quote, the regenerate man finds no time so fit to raise his soul to heaven as when he wakes at midnight, nor any consolation so great as in those hours borrowed from sleep to converse with God in holy meditations. In this Christian context, the candle becomes a symbol of the woman's inner light, her soul rising up during these hours borrowed from sleep. By the 1620s, Artists throughout the Netherlands, and I should note other parts of Europe, like France and England, were all experimenting with different approaches to depicting night. Although she is often considered separately from her male peers, Harlem and Amsterdam-based artist Judith Leister made important contributions to the development of nocturnal narrative themes and visual techniques. Her paintings also reveal a little bit about the gendered dimension of night which men and women in Europe experienced very differently. Leister, the word, translates into a comet or a lodestar, and it was a name adopted by Leister's father from the family brewing business that he had established. 
Leicester then used a J and an L crossed with a star as her monogram to sign her paintings. You can see an example of this on the right. Period writers in her hometown of Harlem named Leicester a quote unquote leading star of the art world, unique as a woman with a professional art practice. While Leicester painted plenty of daylight scenes as well, with her monogram and her many explorations of nocturnal imagery, she aligned herself with her night pieces. Leicester and her husband, fellow artist Jan Means Molinar, along with their peers, were all absorbed with optical effects and the, in the creation of convincing depictions of reality and paint, including the unique mode of viewing at night. It is significant that this painting by Molinar on the right was, is part of a series by him depicting the five senses with this nocturnal scene representing the sense of sight. In Leicester's last drop on the left and now in the Philadelphia Museum of Art <clears throat> and in Molinar's sight, the shadowy darkness of night become a shield for vices like smoking and drinking to excess. In Molinaire's painting, a small oil lamp casts just enough light to alert the man and woman at the table that their drink is running out. In Leicester's painting, the candle illuminating the scene is held by the specter of death. Even though the skeleton holds up the candle and hourglass to the young men celebrating, they cannot see it. Their sight is clouded by drink as well as by night, sight and night. In the house inventory created at the time of Molinaire's death in 1668, the house that he shared with his wife, Judith Leister, there was among their various studio props, a telescope in Dutch in Verkeiker. It is impossible to know exactly how Molinaire and Leister would have used their telescope, which were beginning to become popular by the mid 1600s. However, its presence in their home and art studio spaces preserves their interest in optical devices and specifically those that aided in nocturnal viewing experiences. For example, the newly fashionable activity of stargazing. While no nocturnal landscapes by Leicester or Molinaire are known to my knowledge, although I would be happy to be corrected about that, their portrayals of a spectrum of nocturnal activities reveal their interest in exploring the visual effects created by night. In this painting by Leicester of two men and a woman playing a game of trick track, she again explored the link between the late hours and human folly with its focus on smoking, drinking, playing games and young men and women socializing together. The painting is equally a warning and a celebration of nocturnal carousing. Leicester took advantage of the warmth and strength of the oil lamp light to enhance the figure's flushed faces and the glint and gleam of their clothing. Unlike the women in the paintings by Honthorst I showed earlier, Leicester's woman does not wear the low cut bodice that would have clearly marked her as a courtesan. Her modest outfit leaves her exact identity more ambiguous. Would she have been a quote unquote fallen woman in the minds of Dutch 17th century viewers? Or is she just enjoying a night out? For women in 17th century Europe, entering public spaces at night was becoming more common, but was also fraught territory, leaving them open to criticism and suspicion. Leicester's paintings of women engaged in needlework at night are among her most intriguing. They portray female characters deeply concentrated on creative labor. The mood in these works is mysterious with narratives that like the one in A Game of Trick Track are purposefully open-ended. Leicester's painting now often titled The Proposition depicts a woman sewing by lamplight while a man looms behind her offering coins. From a Fox Hofrichter has argued that the painting represents Leicester's critical response to the period's brothel scenes by showing a virtuous woman turning away from a man trying to bribe her with money for sex. 
The woman, however, is having none of it. She is wholly absorbed in her own nighttime labor. And the, sh the shadow behind the man increases the sense of his threat to the woman and also, also emphasizes night as a time when women were especially vulnerable to men's bad behavior. Images of women snowing, sewing or engaged in needlework frequently emphasize connections between sight, aesthetics, and sometimes night. In Gertrud Raumann's engraving of two women sewing from a decade labor, later on the right, for instance, two women are sewing beside one another as the late afternoon sun hits them. However, they have a large freestanding candle stick waiting for them as dusk approaches. And these and other images of women sewing, <clears throat> the figures often seem to exist in a state that mixes intense concentration and internal rumination. And one remarkable account kept by 15th century Italian woman, Lara Serretta, she overtly connected her nighttime work, sewing and creative and intellectual ambitions writing about staying awake at night to complete an elaborate needlework project, Soretta wrote to a friend, quote, I have no leisure time for my own writing and studies unless I use the night as productively as I can. I sleep very little. Time is a terribly scarce commodity for those of us who spend our skills and labor equally on our families and our own work. But by staying up all night, I become a thief of time. While centuries removed from Leicester, I imagine that Leicester might have connected with Soretta's thoughts about becoming a thief of time to get her own work done. Leicester's imagery of women sewing also depicts them in a similar state of creative labor commingled with passive imagination. And this is similar to nocturnal images of male scholars and artists that emerged in the mid 1600s, especially in the work of Herod Dow and his followers. Herod Dow, based in Leiden throughout his long career, taught multiple generations of artists in his highly detailed manner of painting. Among Dao's many interests as an artist, he latched on to night as a time for productive labor, learning, and creativity, and he returned to nocturnal settings repeatedly. As H. Perry Chapman and Ronnie Baer, among other scholars, have discussed, Dao was a proponent of casting himself and other painters in the image of the pictor doctus, or learned, learned artist rising above their previous position of craftsmen and artisans. Night was a natural atmosphere for Dow to use in his paintings about learning and erudition because of its longstanding links with productive labors of the mind. Dow portrayed astronomers at night as in this work on the left. And it's natural to depict someone who studies the night sky at night in their element. However, nocturnal study in general became increasingly widespread during the 1600s. Returning to what we know about the interrupted sleep cycles of most early modern people, these moments of wakefulness were prized by some for their ability to pull the best and most creative thoughts from one's mind. Contemporary journalist David Randall notes in Dreamland, Adventures of the Strange Science of Sleep, from several years ago, that the brain exhibits high levels of the pituitary hormone prolactin during periods of wakefulness during the night, which may contribute to the feeling of peace and inspiration that many people associate with it. Along with waking during the night, early modern scholars specifically aligned the process of staying up late writing by candle or lamplight with a seriousness of purpose. The first published instance of burning the midnight oil as a phrase was by English poet Francis Carles, who wrote in his book of emblems published in 1635, quote, we spend our midday sweat and our midnight oil. We tire the night in thought and the day in toil. 
Similarly, English physician and author Thomas Brown wrote in the 1650s, talking about serious types of scholarly inquiry, but quote, a work of this nature is not to be performed on one leg and should smell of oil if duly and deservedly handled. Smelling of oil was then a sign of work well done. Nocturnal labor and the link between night and diligent learning were per pervasive ideas in the Netherlands and particularly in the university center of Leiden. Here at Dow's depictions of night schools or lessons taking place in the evening, which you see on the right, <clears throat> feature both boys and girls learning alongside one another under the glow of candles, oil lamps, and lanterns. Students often received instruction in the evenings after completing other responsibilities, and so their work would have literally smelled of oil. In Dow's night school, created in the early 1660s, the schoolmaster, you can see him here with his beret, <clears throat> guides a young girl in her reading by the glow of a large candle. These lights display Dow's skill with artificial light and allude to the conceptual light of understanding and knowledge. To the left of the painting, here, an older girl holds a candle up towards a fellow student and she takes over as teacher for this boy sitting next to her. Dow explicitly linked his scenes of nocturnal study and labor with his ideas about the importance of artistic training. In Dow's young artist drawing by lamplight on the right, he places a young artist in the same kind of position of late night concentration as a student or astronomer. Comparing Dow's painting with an etching by his teacher, Rembrandt van Rijn, another famous maker of dark paintings, it becomes clear that Dow purposefully adapted Rembrandt's composition. The large tome of Rembrandt's student becomes the bound sketchbook of Dow's young artist. For artists, the night offered not only uninterrupted time for thinking, but also enhanced visual experience. Among Leonardo da Vinci's recommendations to young artists, he had written that, quote, it is of no small benefit on finding oneself in bed in the dark to go over again in the imagination, the main outlines of the forms previously studied or of noteworthy things conceived by ingenious speculation. Writing about this painting by Terbruchen that we've already seen, Susan Donahue Koretsky has persuasively argued that Terbruchen was aligning himself as an artist with the scholarly man in his nocturnal writing. As she notes, the man signs the name of Terbruchen himself in beautiful calligraphic script on the page in front of him. The candle flame that allows the man to record his thoughts fuses with Terbruchen's own artistic practice. Artists both need light and they have the faculties to depict this ephemeral immaterial phenomena. Dow's student on the right is significantly drawing a Cupid figure linking together night, love, and love of art. And on the flip side from solitary inner worlds of night, Herod Dow also devoted several paintings to Knight's role as an inspiration, not only for art, but also for romantic flirtations and trysts. Unlike earlier paintings of body tavern scenes by Hontors, Tebruchen, and others, Dow's interpretation of nighttime romances generally contain complex allusions to different moralistic emblems and literary conceits. He was well versed in these as a learned artist living in the intellectual center of Leiden. In his wine cellar and allegory on the right, he juxtaposed a young man flirting with a young woman pouring wine. An older figure warms themselves alone by a fireplace in the deep background towards the right. And this almost works as an inverse of his painting of the woman at the window holding the candle. 
in this painting, there are two figures in the distance and she is by herself in the foreground, uh, which is a neat opposition to the allegory of winter on the right with the two people in the foreground and the single older person in the distance. And Dow's audiences loved these kinds of complex relationships that his paintings had with one another. Dow's studio in the 1650s and 1660s became a center for artists interested in learning to depict nocturnal themes. <clears throat> Dow's nephew and student, Dominicus von Toll, uh, represented in this exhibition, produced this painting of a boy holding a mouse trap. As Junko Yono has written, while the scene appears like a straightforward domestic moment, checking on a mouse trap, the boy is likely warning the viewer about the dangers of love's snares. The dark cellar, along with the wine barrel and the dead bird, both of which had strong sexual associations, suggest that the mouse trap alludes to love's captivity. 17th century writers, Jakob Katz and Daniel Heinzius, each wrote that a lover is a captive of love, just as a mouse is a captive of its trap. Another of Dow's students, Godfried or Godefriede Schalken, <clears throat> developed his own unique take on candlelit imagery, as with Van Toll. Schalken, especially early on in his career, frequently adapted his teacher Dow's more restrained and literary approach to scenes of nocturnal romance and eroticism. An important aspect of these scenes of eroticism and romance is their small scale. Many are barely larger than a modern postcard. They could have been and likely were sometimes handheld viewing experiences suiting their intimate content. I'm going to end by talking about one of Schalken's paintings from the 1680s that brings together many of the themes that I've talked about today. I will also admit that this is one of my favorite dep depictions of an artist's studio at night and one of my favorite paintings in the Leiden collection. By the 1680s, Schalken had established his own career and he had firmly positioned himself as a specialist in nocturnal settings and candle and lamplit imagery. In this painting, a young man dressed in an artist beret and informal robes examines a statuette of Venus alongside a young woman. They compare the statuette to a drawing picturing the same pose that the man clasps in his hand. The oval created by the shallow cast of lamp light draws the figures into a kind of triad with the statue. Leaving no question to the man's intentions, he points directly toward where the statue's genitals would be. While the woman's inner motivations are not as clearly defined, her smile suggests that both art and desire are being cultivated during this nighttime studio encounter. <clears throat> Unlike Judith Leister's depiction of a woman hounded by a looming man with money, Schalken's painting constructs a scene of reciprocal intimacy facilitated by night. While his painting was probably not intended to be a direct portrait, like Dow's, like Dow's portrayals of artists, Schalken was crafting a visual concept of artistic practice that fit with the public image he wanted to put forward. Similar to da Vinci's advice and an account of Italian artist Carlo Marotti, it was written that Murati would come home after a long day of artistic study and immediately start on his quote, nocturnal vigils, vigils. He would prolong the hours with great pleasure and the silence of night producing beautiful ideas that he drew from his mind. And these ideas of artists staying up late into the night to find their inspiration were becoming increasingly common by Schalken's time. Schalken's artist breaks with the idea of the solitary scholar artist working in isolation that we saw in his teacher Dow's works. Instead, almost looking forward to later romantic dep depictions of artists in the 18th and 19th centuries, Schalken's couple use the late hours to exchange artistic knowledge, mutually inspired by their amorous bond, 
overseen by Venus as a goddess of love and muse of art. Just a few years later, Schalken painted his own portrait by candle or lamplight, candlelight, excuse me, three times in the course of two years, cementing his public persona as a romantic artist of the night. In a far cry from the criticism of Caravaggio and Rembrandt's dark paintings, a period print of one of these portraits of Schalken described his ability to draw beauty from shadows. These two frames are from director Stanley Kubrick's film, Barry Lyndon from 1975. While an adaptation of the 18th century William Makepeace Thackeray novel and full to the brim with allusions to 18th century artworks, Kubrick also drew inspiration from the 17th century candlelit paintings that I've been speaking about today. There are famous accounts of how difficult it was for the cast and crew to work with the volume of candles required for the film to be shot exclusively with candlelight. Super wide aperture lenses were retrofitted to be able to pick up enough light and eventually reflectors were attached to ceilings to reduce the number of candles and keep the smoke and the heat of them at bay. These practical issues of the candles remind us just how different the experience of nighttime was for people in the pre-electric, pre-gaslight 17th century. Candles, even the finest ones, were very expensive and they could be smelly and even dangerous. People accidentally falling asleep with lit candles led to entire rooms and houses catching fire. And yet there was a strong urge on the part of many early modern people to steal hours from the night to use as their own and to depict these late night goings on in art. As many symbolic and allegorical meanings as night had in the 1600s, the night pieces that I've shown here also in some way reflect lived realities. Night then as now offered a unique sense of privacy, secrecy, stillness. Nighttime hours could seem out of time, an inner world for love, for spiritual vision and for creative invention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, for um, taking us into the dark world of 17th century interiors on this beautiful late May spring day. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to be in this very rich world with you. Um, we already have a few questions bubbling up in the Q&A, and I want to encourage our audience to use that um, feature of the Zoom to write down questions, and I will transmit them to you, Nicole, as the moderator. Um, I just want to take a minute uh, to thank you for this talk. I also wanted to thank Heather Moktadari for being an excellent colleague and so much fun to work with on this exhibition. And of course, um, to thank Lara Yeager Krasout, the, the curator of the Leiden Collection for bringing these really precious and um, exquisite paintings to campus at Penn. It's really wonderful to have them on campus right now. So Nicole, in your talk, you've shown us how candlelight can mean several things, right, in the context of the Dutch Republic. Um, you first talked about how these dark paintings draw our focused attention in to thematize looking and viewing. Um, you also had us thinking about these dark interiors as um, spaces that are indicative of the labors of the mind, right, of a certain kind of scholarly attention. I was also really struck um, by the light motif of gender in your talk and the way that um, we saw a, a number of uh, contrasting ways that women are shown in, in dark interiors, right? That we have the inner light of the soul of, evoked in the um, Terbruchen painting, The Allegory of Faith. And then we have these sort of sexual and erotic awakenings in the, in the Tao, uh, busty woman leaning out of, um, the window and the um, Schalken painting of the, um, the, that you ended with of the young man and woman studying a statue of Venus. And so this sort of range, this panoply of meanings that you've given us um, raised a number of questions for me and probably for our audience too. Some of them, you know, really art historical questions about 
uh, about these works and these painters. Um, and some of them socio-historical about sort of cycles of nighttime and sleep, um, labor and restfulness. Um, but, I, but I also wanted to ask, I guess I wanted to launch the Q&A with a question about this different material properties of the different light sources, right? You showed us candles, which are um, either wax or tallow. We, we also um, saw oil lamps and you talked a bit about the smell of oil. Um, and I loved thinking about that. We also saw, I think, a foot warmer in one of the paintings with a, um, I don't know if that was generated by uh, coal or what. Um, and I'm wondering about these sort of different materials uh, and the different material properties of these um, sources of illumination and um, whether they take on, these different kinds of illuminants take on different meanings based on um, the properties of oil or the properties of tallow or the properties of wax, et cetera. What's your sense of that? That's, thank you for, um, yeah, thank you for your comments. And, and that's a really great question. Maybe I'll, should I stop sharing my screen or is it handy to have it up to go back to things? Um, um, why don't you stop for now? Uh, and then if, 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 we want to look closely at something you can pull it back. Um, yeah, so the 1600s is a really, I mean, well, it's a hundred year period. Um, so obviously a lot happened, uh, but it's a really interesting period for the history of artificial illumination. So often, um, often histories of artificial illumination kind of begin with the advent of gaslight uh, and then continue into electricity, but artificial light technology uh, was being developed over a much longer history. Um, so from the 1400s through the end of the 1600s, this is a period where uh, technologies around artificial lighting in general um, became more present and also became cheaper over time. And this had to do with a variety of facts from uh, developing technologies around the production of wax candles, uh, which were an improvement on tallow candles or, or ta um, reeds that could be lit uh, with tallow to, to slow the burn um, of the reed. Uh, and then it also had to do with things like um, explorations across oceans and the discovery of spermatoa in whales that could be cultivated for the use of um, burning as an, as an oil. Um, but all of these technologies um, would be pretty subpar in the way that we think of lighting today as natural flip of a switch, no odor, um, no, uh, no real danger to think about unless something goes wrong. Uh, whereas in this period, um, the kind of candles and lighting you had access to would vary a lot depending on your um, class level uh, and also your uh, location, were you in a city or were you out on a farm somewhere? Um, so in general, wax candles were preferred, um, sometimes even over oil, some kinds of oil lamps. As oil lamps could illuminate more space, they had a higher, uh, they have higher lumens, um, to use that phrase, um, but they could also, they could also be really smelly. And there are even uh, guidebooks that instruct people on how to add things like herbs and spices into their candle mix or into their like lamp oil in order to, if it was going to smell, at least perfume the smell that was coming off of it. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. There are accounts and plays that talk about um, women requesting that their maids put away the tallow candles and bring out the wax candles if someone important is coming over. So they were definitely a status symbol too. That's really interesting. Thanks, thanks for that. And I, um, I love thinking about the different source materials that you have to, to answer that you can harness to answer that question. Um, we have a number of excellent questions in the chat. Some of them are are urgent art historical matters. So I, I'm going to launch right into the um, to the Q and A that we have from our audience. And I'm going to group two two of these questions together because I think that they're related. So um, Barbara Mole is asking. Um, about whether the paintings are actually made at night. 
whether these paintings of nocturnal scenes are made at night um, or were they painted during the day. And um, on top of that, we, um, we have a wonderful question by Henrietta Ketz de Vries about um, if, if they were uh, created or at least meant to be seen in darkly lit spaces, whether you think we're over lighting them in our modern museums settings. So one, one question is sort of taking us back to the creation and the, and the um, conditions of their creation and the other is about the conditions of their display today. Oh, those are both such great questions. Um, and I think that I like many art historians would love for there to be more textual evidence about exactly how people were viewing um, their paintings in general and including uh, nocturnal paintings with nocturnal themes. Um, as far as the making, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, most likely these paintings would be made at least partially under daylight circumstances um, because if you think of your own experience, the moment you're in darkness, uh, your ability to see colors reduces Human beings actually have relatively good night sight compared to other animals, a lot of which are close to blind at night. Um, human beings um, have relatively strong eyesight at night, uh, but within that, the colors perception reduces. So night was definitely a time when um, artists, including painters, made drawings, made sketches, uh, and worked on things that wouldn't require their perception of color. Uh, but for most paintings, probably at a certain stage, they would need to take them into more of a daylight circumstance to, to check the colors. Um, and, that and being, may I just add printmaking too, right, Nicole? I've yeah. done a lot of um, etching, and we saw this in the Rembrandt example that you showed us, a lot of etching took place at night and by candlelight. So, yeah, 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 and there are also drawings and, and um, uh, matrices for for prints were also often things that you could hold in your hand. So close up to a candle or a lamplight near you, whereas paintings you often needed more distance um, to kind of uh, have your full setup with the palette and, and mall stick and all that. Um, but that's a really good point. And, um, and that said, I, nighttime was a time when art students were encouraged to study because one thing that you do get at night that you don't get during the day is very even lighting. Once you set up your candle or your lamp light, you can rely on that light projecting out in an even way that's not going to change. Whereas in daylight, you could come back to your painting after stepping away for a few minutes and realize that your lighting circumstance had completely changed. Um, so for, for um, students of art, people who were still training, uh, that kind of even lighting was was prized, um, but again, mostly for sketches instead of for paintings. And then for viewing them, people definitely did look at their art collections um, after dark. And I, sorry if I was clumsy in this during the talk, I mean, after dark does represent a huge span of time in the early modern period, especially during the winter time when it's getting dark by 4 or 5 p.m. Um, so people definitely did look at their collections and there are some fun descriptions of um, people uh, getting closer, pull it, um, pulling a light source closer to a painting in order to be able to better see it. Uh, and so there aren't descriptions specifically of how people would have pulled lighting sources close to paintings that depicted candlelight um, in that kind of doubling of artificial light, uh, but it definitely happened. Um, and I think that that's, that's really interesting to think about. Thanks for those answers. Um, we have a wonderful question from Larry Silver. Hi, Larry, about, Larry. Uh, <laughs> about uh, the participation of some of the paintings that you talked about in series. So Larry says, as you noted early on, the links between times of day and ages of humankind form a set usually of four. Dutch printmakers, for example, made night the last of their sets of times of day. Did Dow or Schalken and other Dutch painters ever compile sets of four times of day in which their spectacular night scenes formed a major part? That's a really good question. Were you going to say something else, Shira? Um, and Larry follows up um, with, the, he, he makes the point that he can see that Dow's 
allegory of winter with its old man in the background could be part of a contrasting summer complement or even part of a quartet of times of day and ages of man analogy. So is there any evidence of others in such a series? Um, I, there, there is, I'm trying to think of examples from Dow and his followers specifically. Um, Maybe they'll come to me, uh, but the, but there are examples of either um, two paintings side by side or or multiples um, that were meant to use night and and one component uh, as a contrast to daytime scenes. And there are also some discussions of Schalken's work, uh, a student of Dow, uh, where he. Um, he and other people kind of wrote letters to each other describing the best circumstances for viewing his work. Um, and, and some of those, there's a recommendation to place his night scenes near daylight scenes or near landscapes or kind of other uh, daytime genres that depict daytime settings um, to kind of work with that contrast. Uh, so there were definitely, artists were definitely making, still making series um, along those lines, either series of the senses or um, using times of day to, to evoke other um, allegorical concepts. And then they're just within the um, placement in people's art collections, they were thinking about where their, their, their night pieces were positioned compared to other works of art that they owned. Um, that's really wonderful that we have evidence for, for this. Um, well, we promised everyone a one hour program. I'm going to ask one final question because we have a number of really excellent questions uh, in the Q&A. And if Nicole didn't have the opportunity to answer your question, I encourage you to reach out and, and contact her. Um, so I'm going to give our last question to uh, our curator, Lara. Uh, who is, is writing in from the Leiden collection. And um, she says, Nicole, you briefly discussed the experience of contemporary viewers holding these small paintings, which enhance the intimate viewing experience. And, and I'm asking you this, I'm, I'm choosing Lara's question now, Nicole, because it builds on what you were just talking about, about sort of considering these viewing conditions. So Lara wants to know, could you speak a bit more about how collectors would have seen, held, or examined nocturnal scenes by Dow, Schalken, and Fantol? Do you think that the use of curtains, cabinet doors, for example, have played a special role in this context? Mm, that's a great question. And um, hello, Laura and Lara, and thank you so much uh, to you and everyone else at the Leiden Collection. Um, it's so great to be back discussing these works. Um, and uh, Yes, I, I think um, I'm hesitant to say that there was any particular use of viewing circumstances like curtains or frames that open and close um, that was unique to night pieces or, or pieces showing nocturnal themes because that was such a big part of viewing circumstances for paintings in general, especially these smaller scale ones that you get further into the, the 1600s. Um, but I think that um, there is there is definitely evidence um, for people picking up small paintings and examining them in a, in a handheld context in general and um, actually this becomes a really, this is kind of like the proto moment of the whole eroticized concept of um, seduction that that becomes that kind of joke, like why don't you come up and see my etchings um, line <laughs> um, because in, in, in Libertine and um, in, especially once you get into um, 18th century erotic literature, this whole idea of having candles and using them, holding them and using them to illuminate works of art that might be suggestive in their, in their subject matter or even, um, you know, one another as, as uh, people in, involved in this um, intimate encounter become really common. So it's absolutely something that people were, were doing. Um, and 
I can um, I can share a couple of, of really interesting kind of literary sources for that. Um, and so I think that that's with specifically within an erotic context, but I think it was definitely happening just uh, with encounters with works of art in general. Well, that's a great answer. And it makes me think of the Schalken flames, which are always seem to be tilting or bending, almost like indicating sort of a figure yielding uh, to another. Um, so, so the flame has a sort of will of its own and can, can direct. Um, well, thank you so much, Nicole, for this wonderful talk. I want to encourage everyone in the audience to please visit the Arthur Ross Gallery and to see these magnificent paintings from the Leiden Collection while we have them on campus. Um, this is something that it is both safe and easy to do. Uh, I've enjoyed several trips there myself, and I hope uh, you'll all uh, make it to the gallery um, for, for a time to visit so that you can um, enjoy it. Thank you so much, Heather, and thank you, Nicole, again, for this exquisite talk. Thank you so much and, and huge thanks to you, Shira, to Heather, to Lara and everyone else involved. It's been such a pleasure to be here and please go see the show and these really jewel-like works of art. You'll have a, a really fantastic experience. Thank you.